Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERDAP and ESTCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a principal at Geosyntec Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDAP and ESTCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of the CERDAP and ESTCP programs by Catherine Kay in the program office followed by a listing of the upcoming webinars in the webinar series. Following Catherine's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. Today's webinar features two speakers who will discuss um, munitions response using underwater geophysical sensors. First, Dr. Mark Cowdy uh, will talk about the development of a real-time underwater magnetometer array his presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session. Then Dr. Thomas Bell will discuss the use of underwater electromagnetic sensors for UXO detection and classification in marine environments. We will conclude the webinar with an interactive Q&A session, including both our speakers. Just some reminders. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions in advance of the Q&A session. With over 300 people on today's call, it is logistically challenging to open all the lines for oral questions. Therefore, your phone lines will remain listen-only throughout the entire presentation. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in the event that you experience difficulties with the broadcast audio. Typically, any delay will be fixed if you refresh your screen or use the conference line to call into the webinar. However, if you continue to have problems, please submit a comment using the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. With that, I would like to introduce Catherine Kay from HGL. Catherine has supported CERDAP and ESCCP for 14 years, including the munitions response program area, as well as general contract management support. She has assisted with a variety of ESCCP munitions response advisory groups and currently serves as the program advisor to the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council Geophysical Classification for Munitions Response Team. And with that, I turn it over to you, Catherine. Great. Thank you, Rula. I'm happy to welcome everyone to CERDIP and ESDCP's webinar today. And I'll go ahead and get started. CERDIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the DOD, the Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERDIP's mission is to identify and address high-priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. CERDIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impacts real-world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERDIP and other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERDIP and ESTCP are complementary programs with much of CERDIP research occurring in the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale although occasionally supporting lab efforts are conducted. There are four program areas in CERDIP and five in ESTCP. The Energy and Water Program area is the only in ESTCP, while the other four, Environmental Restoration, Munitions Response, Resource Conservation and Climate Change, and Weapon Systems and Platforms, are CERDIP and ESTCP programs managed jointly by a designated program manager. Our webinar today is focused on research conducted under the Military Munitions Response Program area. There are two main areas of this program, and the first addresses munitions on land, which is coming to a conclusion. Final demonstrations of classification technologies applied to munitions response 
are being conducted this year, and the programs are now focusing resources to address munitions underwater. Munitions underwater has three main subcomponents. The first topic is wide area surveys to help find areas of concern or targeted areas, and detailed surveys to find individual munitions, which is where the topic of today's webinar falls. The second component of the program addresses cost-effective recovery and disposal of munitions underwater. And the final topic is to study the character characteristics of munitions underwater, the environment that they exist in, and their mobility. Overall, our webinar series will be highlighting research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas. The next webinar based on research and demonstrations under munitions response will be on November 12th and we'll discuss the closeout of the land-based munitions response program. You can find more information about upcoming webinars on the CERTIP and ESTCP website, and I hope you enjoy today's webinar. Thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to Rula to introduce the first speaker. Great. Thank you, Catherine. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Prouty. Mark is the president of Geometrics in San Jose, California. Prior to this, he was chief technical officer and Vice President of Engineering starting in 1994. His work at Geometrics focuses on the development of geophysical instruments, including near-surface exploration seismographs, ele electromagnetic instrumentation, and magnetometers for exploration and UXO detection. Mark has led many government-funded research programs, including the Advanced Ordnance Locator. He has served as a PI for a number of CERTIP and ESCCP projects, including the Metal Mapper Project, which won the ESCCP Project of the Year Award in 2010. Mark received his PhD in Electrical Engineering from the University of California at Berkeley in 1994. And with that, I turn it over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you very much. I'm happy to uh, participate in the webinar this morning. Uh, Geometrics designs and manufactures many types of geophysical instruments among them magnetometers, which are one of the tools used to locate unexploded ordnance both on land and underwater. Uh, today I'm happy to talk about our recent work developing a real-time magnetometer array and especially the required sensor technology which makes such a system possible. I'll first discuss the traditional methods of using magnetometers for unexploded ordnance detection and the limitations of those methods that we addressed in our work. Then I'll discuss the development of new sensing technologies and how they can address those limitations. I'd also like to show the results we have obtained in our sensor developments, as well as a demonstration of the results using a real-time array. Let me first explain how magnetometers work. A magnetometer senses ferrous objects through the effect such objects have on the Earth's magnetic field. All ferrous objects such as unexploded targets of interest, distort the surrounding magnetic field. By making extremely precise measurements of the magnetic field, the distortions in the field caused by the ferrous material can be visualized. However, these distortions in the field occur over a certain region of space above the object. One has to take many measurements over a broad area, in effect to map out the field to determine where exactly the object that is creating the disturbance is located. This mapping of the field can be quite cumbersome. Traditional sensors are large, expensive, and consume a lot of power. Therefore, in today's usage, a relatively small number of magnetometers, this photo shows an array of five such systems, are towed back and forth over the desired region storing the magnetic field readings as well as the positions where each data point was taken. This, of course, is the traditional magnetometer survey step. Once a region has been surveyed with the magnetometer, the readings are downloaded onto a computer and a magnetic field map is created here on the right. As shown on that map, each target can be clearly seen as a magnetic anomaly. Variations from a uniform field indicate the presence of ferrous material. Software, such as shown on the left, is used to individually analyze each anomaly to determine the parameters of the target, such as its position, size, 
and even its orientation. Such software uses a dozen or so readings spread out to delineate the object. In this traditional process, once the data has been analyzed offline in such a manner, a diver must go back to the site and reacquire the target in order to expose and remove it. If sensors were cheaper, smaller, and lower power, enough of them could be deployed to solve for the target location on the spot from a set of measurements taken all at once. This will make the reacquisition process much easier or even eliminate the survey step altogether. This was the goal of our work. CERDIP began funding development of this technology in, in about 2006. In MM1512, Geometrics, along with partners at government labs NIST and Sandia, demonstrated the basic technology. A follow-on project further probed higher performance sensor regimes. The work I'm describing today was the primary focus of MR2104, which we are just now completing. Motivated by the desire to use these sensors in a real-time array, Geometrics has developed the system shown on the lower right. A small electronics module can drive two independent sensors. For comparison, Geometrics traditional magnetometer with just a single sensor is shown here in the upper right. With the new system correctly scaled for size comparison, it's dramatically smaller and lighter than the existing systems. I'd like to point out what new technologies enabled the development of such a sensor, but first I need to mention a few words about how these sensors operate. Individual cesium atoms have a tiny magnetic moment. Because of this, each atom will precess or wobble like a spinning top in the magnetic field. This is depicted here in the, on these diagrams here showing the precession vector or the, the magnetic moment vector precessing about the magnetic field. The rate or frequency at which this, this uh, precession occurs is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. By measuring the frequency of this precession, then, the magnetic field may be determined. Frequency is a quantity that is very easy to measure precisely, and this is why cesium magnetometers are so sensitive. In order to measure the frequency of precession, we must have a means of interacting with the cesium atoms. This is done by shining light of the exact cesium wavelength through a vapor of atoms. As those atoms precess, the amount of light they absorb changes. Thus, the brightness of the light passing through varies at the precession frequency. This is how that frequency, and therefore the magnetic field, is determined. Looking at a sketch of the traditional sensor, then, I'd like to highlight the technological advances that were responsible for making a lower power sensor. In a traditional sensor, the light source is a cesium discharge lamp which creates light by heating cesium atoms. This has the advantage of producing the proper wavelength, but it is highly inefficient. It creates mostly heat, not light. The first step in creating a lower power sensor, therefore, was to replace the discharge lamp with a tiny laser diode. Lasers are very efficient, so this saves a lot of power, but their wavelength is not automatically that of cesium. It requires considerable effort to control the wavelength precisely enough this is done through precise computer control of the temperature of the laser diodes. Using the laser beam instead of a cesium discharge lamp also allows for an improved method of operating the devices. For example, in order to amplify the signal from the individual cesium atoms, some mechanism must be used to control the orientation of all those atoms so that their signals add together to create a measurable influence on the light beam passing through. In the traditional sensor, this is done by introducing a coil, the so-called H1 coil, here, wrapped around the cell and driving an electrical signal through that coil. With a laser beam, we can apply this signal to the laser itself instead of a separate coil. This is a more efficient method, producing better sensitivity, and, then it, le then, and it then allows us to reduce the cell size. 
since the cell must be heated for best operation, reducing its size reduces the power consumption. Eliminating this H1 coil also allows the sensors to be positioned closer together. They tend to radiate electromagnetic energy into its neighboring sensor if they're too close. I'll show an example of this benefit later. Finally, using modern digital electronics methods, many of the functions that were performed by inefficient analog electronics in earlier sensing systems may now be done digitally. Since all of the electrical signals now required are low power, the large and bulky electronics may be eliminated. All of these components together in a small package was a significant challenge. Tiny lasers, cesium cells, heating elements, and several optical components have to be packaged with a careful eye towards the thermal management of the system. The temperature of each component must be controlled individually, so the best sensitivity may be obtained and they're all packaged very, very close together. As we have developed the fundamental technologies under CERTIP funding, Geometrics has also invested considerably in methods that will allow for manufacturing these, sen these sensors in large quantity. I mentioned previously that there was an advantage in eliminating the H1 coil from the sensor. This slide shows how that was done. Two lasers are actually used in the device. The signal that was previously applied to the H1 coil is applied to one of the lasers. The brightness of the second laser is measured as it passes through the cell. If the signal applied to the first is at the exact precession frequency, a large brightness variation appears on the second laser beam. If the frequency is off only slightly, the second laser beam is unaffected. This sets up a resonance system for determining the precession frequency, which is easily converted into a precise magnetic field measurement. A photograph of the actual electronic system is shown at the bottom. There are two sensors shown here, which may be positioned according to the desired application. In this photo, they're shown right on top of each other, but they may be, they may be positioned up to a meter apart. Each sensor is actually on its own cable, though that is difficult to tell from this picture. Further renderings of the system are shown on this slide. The electronics module consists of three circuit boards. An exploded <laughs> view of the sensor itself is shown on the upper right. This design allows for more rapid modifications in smaller quantities, and we manufacture that at Geometrics. In partnership with Geometrics, Texas Instruments is developing techniques for manufacturing the, cell, the sensor using silicon chip technologies. Their device is shown on the lower right. A prototype of their sensor is shown there on the lower right. Their device can be produced in extremely large quantities, hundreds of thousands, further lowering the cost of these sensors. The performance of these devices is as good as Geometric's existing flagship commercial products. The red curve shows noise levels of Geometric's existing commercial sensors and the blue curve shows the performance of these new devices. As shown here, we have achieved the gains in system usability, lower power consumption, smaller size, without any reduction in performance. The increase in noise at low frequency here is an artifact of the shielding system used in making this measurement. It's not actually a property of the sensor. An example of the data collection is shown here. With the elimination of the coil, the H1 coil I mentioned in the traditional design, the sensors may be positioned more closely together. This, is an, this shows the benefit of doing that. It allows for the cancellation of signals from more distant objects. In this slide, two signals are superimposed. A small screwdriver is wiggled rapidly near the sensor, creating this high frequency signal. The broader anomalies are due to a passing vehicle. Since the signals from the more distant automobile are equal in both sensors, plotting the difference between the sensor readings on the right largely eliminates that signal while the screwdriver signal is not changed. This is a simple illustration of how the readings of multiple sensors can be combined to discriminate between targets, the screwdriver, and background noise, the automobile. 
What is unique about this particular measurement is how close we were able to position the two sensors in order to cancel the signal from the car. Again, this is due to the elimination of the H1 coil in the old design. More interestingly, let's look at how a larger array of sensors can be used to determine details of a target in real time. <coughs> a conceptual rend rendering of a diver-held array is shown at the left. In order to make sure such an array could be easily maneuvered by divers, we built a mock-up and went to a diving club in Monterey Bay. With the small frame that is enabled by these new sensors, we discovered that the system was readily maneuverable in the water. The laboratory measurement system shown here is somewhat less maneuverable. This system was built several years ago but demonstrated the dramatic results that can be obtained with arrays. Since building this system, of course, we have dramatically reduced the size of the sensors, the cabling, and the electronics. So we can now build this system as indicated in the previous slide. We're now in the process of procuring parts to do just that. It's very interesting, however, to review the measurements we made with this prototype system as we can demonstrate the enormous benefits that arise from analyzing measurements from an array in real time. First of all, we wrote a processing scheme that performs the same mathematical inversion on the data that is traditionally done in post-processing. I showed the maps and the software screens earlier in this presentation. This scheme, however, is very rapid, and we demonstrated it can keep easily keep up with 10 readings per second from each of the sensors, so there's no lag between the display and the motion of the array. Since our array was too bulky to be moved, we simulated the motion, the relative motion between the array and the target by actually moving the target rather than the array. The tracking algorithm continuously plots the location of the target as a red dot. This plot The plot shows a plan view of the target located in two dimensions, but the depth, the size, and even the orientation of the object are all calculated in real time. The accuracy of the system is quite good. This plot shows the actual versus calculated position of the target. The black dots show the x-coordinate as the object is moved along the x-axis over the array at a constant y and z coordinate. All the values are exactly as expected. What is very interesting, however, is how the system behaves when confronted with the difficult situations. When analyzing magnetometer data over actual sites, errors are often made when two objects are close together. This confuses the algorithms that are trying to interpret the readings as being from a single target. This slide shows how a real-time system behaves in this scenario. When one object is nearer to the center of the array, the location algorithm locks on to that target. As the array is moved past the pair of targets, the system locks first on one and then eventually to the other. This is exactly how one would want such a system to behave, and this behavior would be easy for the operator to interpret in the field. When the array is positioned in between two targets, the inversion algorithm breaks down there's a certain region where the instrument is confused. In this region, the target position given by the instrument moves wildly in depth as the array is moved only slightly. This wild variation in depth occurs over a small motion of the system. This indicates to the diver that the information is not to be trusted. As the array is moved further, once it is centered over another one of the targets, the, the solution again becomes consistent and locked onto the correct position of the other target. The point is that by moving the array, different views of the pair of objects may be obtained. With a gridded data set gathered in a rigid survey without any input from the actual me measurements, nothing can be done later. The real-time nature of the array allows the operator to spend more time, in effect gathering more data, at the complex locations. This is actually an unexpected benefit of the real-time array. 
the real-time array not only gives an immediate answer in the simple scenarios, it also gives much clearer information in the troublesome situations. To summarize, one benefit of the diver-held array is to improve the traditional data acquisition method by enabling easier relocation of the targets, previously analyzed offline, for subsequent removal and disposal. The real-time target location <coughs> will guide the diver to the target, since the array also indicates the same target properties determined in the offline data analysis, this allows the diver to confirm the correct target has been located. The array can also determine if there are any other objects nearby that might have been missed in the previous data analysis. Finally, arrays can work well enough to eliminate the previous data gathering survey altogether. If a validation step is desired, a traditional survey could be done after remediation has been accomplished using real-time arrays. <coughs> There's considerable interest in other possible deployment methods enabled by these small sensors. People have long desired to use low-power magnetometers in an array, but until now, the sensitivity of low-power devices, such as flux gates or magnetorestrictive devices, have not been high enough. A trade-off has had to be made between convenience and sensitivity. With the development of this new device, this is no longer the case. Unmanned underwater vehicles, sea bottom arrays, and tiny unmanned aerial vehicles are possible deployment platforms. In summary, we're very excited about the potential of these new devices. These small, lightweight sensors perform as well as the best magnetometers today. They significantly reduce the difficulties of gathering magnetometer data, increasing the efficiency of that process. When deployed in arrays, their benefits are even more apparent, making real-time analysis possible. Furthermore, with the availability of inexpensive robotic platforms, systems are readily available for deploying smaller sensors in entirely new ways. This is making existing applications much more convenient and is opening up a host of exciting new applications for high-precision magnetometer sensors. So Geometrics is extremely excited to be a part of this and thanks CERTIP extremely for their support in this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for a very informative presentation. Um, for those of you that require or would like to get additional information about this project, you can download the report. Uh, from the CERTIP and ESCCP uh, webpage using the link here. Just a couple of reminders, you can download a PDF of the slides on the CERTIP and ESCCP webinar um, webpage, number one. And two, if you would like to ask questions, please submit them using the chat box on the left-hand portion of the screen. We have received a number of questions for you, Mark, and we're going to go ahead and start with the Q&A phase. Um, when will the product using these uh, new sensors become available commercially? Right. So we're in the process now of supplying beta sensors for targeted customers and testing them uh, both in our laboratory and just beginning tests outside our laboratory. Uh, so we'll be doing that for the rest of this fall and early spring. Uh, and then products using these devices will become available uh, next summer. Uh, wonderful. And how much will the new sensors cost? These, these sensors, we, we're selling the system that I showed a photo of uh, for $5,000. That's the electronics and the two sensors. This is not contained in a uh, rugged waterproof housing, for example, as, as Geometrics traditional magnetometers are, but these are the raw systems that we're targeting for co-developers who are interested in developing their own applications, for example, and they can start with these more laboratory de uh, devices. Mark, how does that compare to currently available uh, technologies in marine yes, environments? Right. So, so it's about uh, five times lower power consumption, ten times lower in size, uh, similar sensitivity as the existing total magnetic field sensors. 
Thank you. Um, a question from EPA. What is the current marine uh, magnetometer detection capability for small munitions? Uh, for example, 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter projectiles. Okay, yeah. These, the, these, are the, these are the most difficult objects to locate, especially the 20 millimeter ones. But it's all a matter of how closely you can position sensors to the, to the sea bottom and how accurately you can do that. Uh, with the large, bulky tow fish that we've got, this is a difficult problem and a difficult challenge. And we think even, even with, with a more dense array of smaller sensors, that that difficult problem could be better addressed. Great. Uh, can you tell us what the maximum depth these sensors are capable of detecting anomalies? Yeah, that entirely depends on the size of the anomaly. Uh, things like automobiles can be detected from uh, tens of meters away, 500-pound bombs from, from 10 meters away or so, uh, ordnance items, more traditional sizes, uh, uh, 155s, for example, are fairly large. I think those, those are detectable from many meters away. One of the advantages of, of magnetometers is that, in effect, the Earth's field is being used as the transmitter. And so as compared to electromagnetic systems, uh, the, the, the depth of uh, the distance to the target that you can detect such targets is, is much, much greater with a magnetometer. Great, thank you. And what have these types of sensors been used? Excuse me, where or when? What was the first word? Where? Oh, yes. Well, we, Geometrics has long sold these sensors for, for geophysical applications. Uh, they're deployed from airplanes or on land or by towfish. Uh, typical applications are uh, geophysical mapping, mining and mineral body mapping, uh, infrastructure detection for marine systems, looking for pipelines, shipwrecks, for example, and of course the large application for these devices, both on land and in the sea, is for unexploded ordnance detection. Thank you. Uh, do these sensors have any temperature or pressure limitations or any other climate control requirements? Right, yes. The, the pressure limitations would, would, be, would be borne by whatever housing that the uh, uh, that the system was put in. The, the system that I showed pictures of here uh, could not withstand water at all at any pressure, for example. So some, they need to be put in a suitable housing. As for the temperature, uh, the, the temperature of the, of the components inside is, is generally operated about 60 to 80 degrees C, depending on which component we're talking about. We've designed it that way so that up to an uh, ambient temperature of, of 50 degrees, we can still simply heat the internal components. We never have to cool them. Uh, so if, if a person wanted to use it in any warmer environment, we would have to change the design to, to in fact cool some of the interior components, which we don't do. On the low end, the, it's designed for, for a startup of, of minus 40 degrees C. Uh, and uh, depending on the amount of insulation in the surrounding packaging uh, would determine how quickly that the system could warm up at that temperature. So quite a wide temperature range, but a lot of it depends, too, on how much insulation or different packaging somebody wants to put around this sensor in particular applications. Mark, can you remind us what MFAM stands for? Uh, microfabricated atomic magnetometer. Great. Um, another question uh, about the detection capabilities. Would a depth charge in riprap be detected by this new sensor? That's a good question. I, I, uh, it, it very well might with enough current and moving around if, if there are uh, electrical uh, ions in the water sufficient to, to create magnetic fields from large disturbances, um, but I don't actually know. 
uh, that would be an interesting experiment to try. And it's, it's one, of the, one of the reasons we're interested in making the system available to a wide variety of people is to be trying out uh, such applications and seeing what can be seen with these kinds of sensors. Great. All right, and then one last question for you. Um, how do uh, magnetometer sensors compare with EMI sensors? Um, and can the magnetometer systems be combined with EMI systems to some advantage? Right, yes, they definitely can. And the reason, so a magnetic field sensor responds directly to the magnetic field. Uh, an electromagnetic sensor, which is a, a coil of wire, uh, responds to the time rate of change of the magnetic field. So the coil is better suited for high frequency signals, rapidly changing signals, uh, while the magnetometer is better suited for lower frequency signals. And so, so actually it's, there's great interest and, and a follow-on projects where we'll be developing just this is combining the readings and, and providing more information about the target. Back also to the earlier question, the, the, the sensitivity of the d devices is extraordinary. We're actually showing demonstrations where we can, even in an office environment, measure the heartbeat, the magnetic field generated by beating heartbeats with these sensors. It's extraordinary what you can see. So it's entirely possible that, that uh, uh, lots, lots of events will create small magnetic fields that can be seen by these sensors. Wonderful. Thank you again, Mark, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, we're going to try and get to the remaining uh, questions submitted to you in the final Q&A, but right now we're going to go ahead and transition to our second speaker, Dr. Thomas Bell. Uh, Tom is a chief scientist with LIDAS Corporation in Arlington, Virginia. His current areas of research involve adapting ele electromagnetic sensor technology to detect and classify unexploded ordnance in marine environments. He has served as a principal investigator on several successful CERDIP and ESCCP projects to develop and demonstrate advanced electromagnetic sensors for both detecting and classifying UXO on land and in marine environments. One of his projects won the ESCCP Project of the Year Award in 2014. And prior to his CERDIP and ESCCP funding, uh, funded work, Tom was engaged in basic and applied research in physical oceanography. Uh, Tom received a Bachelor of Science in Physics from the University of Maryland in 69 and a PhD in Geophysical Fluid Dynamics from the John uh, Hopkins University in 1973. And with that, we'll turn it over to you, Tom. Thank you, Rula. Um, unlike uh, Mark's talk, uh, we'll be talking about work that is in progress. Uh, this project got started last year, uh, and so I'll be talking about some of the results that we have accumulated to date, and also um, giving some more general background information about the problem and uh, why we're doing what we're doing. It is a, um, a project where we are working with several other organizations. Um, NOVA Research with Dan Steinhurst and Glenn Harbaugh, and the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, Carl Friedrichs, uh, Grace Cartwright, and some of their students. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, a very brief overview of the, what the project is about, and then uh, take a couple of slides to talk about underwater munitions uh, and information that we've learned from magnetic surveys of several sites to sort of to set the stage of, of what we're looking for. Uh, then I will spend a little bit of time talking about uh, electromagnetic induction and how that fits into uh, the, what we're trying to do here uh, in contrast to what Mark was talking about with uh, passive magnetometry. 
unlike in the plain magnetic problem, once you go into a marine environment, salt water, uh, you start introducing complexities into the physical processes that are at work. And I will talk a little bit about that. And then get into the actual work that we've been doing. Uh, that involves measurements in, salt water in a saltwater tank of electromagnetic induction phenomena. We're also doing some field work. Uh, and I'll describe that and results we've got to date, and then move on to where we're headed next with this project, and ultimately how we might see this thing uh, become applied uh, after all the work is done on the sort of project. Basically, um, what we're talking about here is electromagnetic sensor arrays, CERTIP and ESTCP have developed and tested them on land, and they can reliably detect and classify buried munitions under operational conditions. There have been quite a few ESTCP demonstrations. And uh, if you recall the beginning when uh, Catherine was talking, there will be a, um, a webinar in November where Herb Nelson will talk about how this problem, this particular part of the CERTA PSTCP uh, program has been very successful and is basically being closed out and transitioned to commercial use. Um, there is a significant munitions contamination problem in US coastal and inland waters. And the Navy and the Army Corps of Engineers uh, and even the Department of Interior worry about this. Uh, Department of Interior because there's an interest in uh, uh, wind farms on off the East Coast, and they got to worry about uh, contamination when they start trying to install them. The issue here is that the marine environment introduces complexities in the response of these EMI systems, which could adversely affect their performance. I say could because uh, as we'll go through the talk, um, some of the modeling that's been done to date suggests that probably uh, we can not be too, not be hurt too much. Uh, the problem, though, is that there's little actual data on the effects of the marine environment on the relevant electromagnetic signals and noise, and that's really what this project is all about. It's filling in that void, um, an empirical investigation of the effects of the marine environment on electromagnetic induction sensor arrays and their use for munitions detection and classification underwater. The two sorts, the two basic pieces of this project are controlled tests and experiments to address the fundamental physics, and this is being done in a saltwater tank and field measurements of the electromagnetic response of the water column and the underlying sediments in various marine environments. Before I get into uh, to talking about those things, though, I just wanted to very quickly review some of the information that we have about underwater munitions. And this comes from uh, surveys that have been done with towed magnetometer arrays. One was developed and tested under CERTIP and ESTCP, the marine towed array. Uh, that was a big wing shown pictured on the right there, upper right, uh, almost five meters across. It has active depth control and was running one to two meters above the bottom, an array of eight magnetometers in it. And that went to five different sites, uh, almost a thousand kilometers of survey lines, um, 240 hectares of full covered survey. The other uh, sensor that provided some of the information that we'll summarize was actually this geometrics, in this case, a, a two magnetometer array, uh, towed grade uh, radiometer. And this is a passive system, it's just towed along uh, generally two to four meters above the bottom. And uh, we were kindly given data from by geometrics to look at from two sites, uh, one off the uh, east coast of the US and one in 
of Hawaii. Looking at all those data, um, what we find is that um, anomaly distributions, magnetic anomaly distributions, um, can be very similar to what we see on land, moderate density sites, where um, this is actually uh, 100 to 1,000 anomalies per hectare. We lost the uh, superscript in the translation there. Most of the targets that we find uh, are buried in the sediment. Only about 20% are sticking up above the sediment. And we tend to find uh, larger targets. They're more common than they are on land. Uh, intrusive investigations on some of these sites um, find a relatively large number of intact munitions, um, significantly more intact munitions uh, out of the set of anomalies than we would find on land sites. Uh, and so this is sort of what we're dealing with here. Problem is not terribly dissimilar to some of the situations we encounter on land. Uh, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about electromagnetic induction sensors uh, before we get into talking about this project in particular. Uh, these are basically metal detectors. And the way they work is that we have a, a coil uh, that gets energized, run a current through it. That creates a magnetic field. When you shut that down, uh, that sets up currents in nearby metallic objects. And that's sort of shown to the right there. The red uh, arrows show the primary field set up by that transmitter coil. Uh, then you've got, a, in this case, a little cartoon of a bomb. And when that primary field shuts off, you set up little currents running around the target. That creates a, its own time-varying electromagnetic field that is measured by the receive coil, shown in blue. Uh, the, two di the two graphs on the right show the transmit current that creates the initial field and then the voltage that's received by the receive coil, the one in blue. The details of what that response uh, looks like depend on the size and the shape and the orientation of the object. And that's really important because that, all of that information can be extracted from, from the right uh, quality of data that we can collect with these sensors. A passive magnetometer, which only uses the Earth's field and, a, and the magnetic moment that's induced in the target, can't get quite the, uh, the amount of information out of this. It, and basically, uh, that's why we like the electromagnetic induction sensors, because we can use that information that comes out of them to classify targets, as we'll see. The particular sensors that we'll be talking about are ones that were developed for CERTIP by G&G Sciences out in Colorado. Um, and it's the particular system that we're looking at is a four element array of sensors. The picture on the bottom left shows one of the elements of the array. There's a big uh, transmit coil, which is shown here a little cube that sits actually right in the middle there, which is a receiver. Then we take four of those and put them in a tray, and then put them on a, on a cart that somebody can push around with a GPS and a backpack to control it. Um, these systems are have been used quite a bit now. Um, and. Uh, I think there's probably about a half a dozen of them now that are being used at various munitions response sites. The, um, the way that these things are used for classification is that um, if we have, if we observe that eddy current decay in the target from a complete range of, of directions in which we've excited it, then um, we can actually 
determine specific properties about the target. Um, we excite and measure the target from many directions. And this sequence of pictures here shows you know, when this particular transmitter was firing, we excited it this way. When this transmitter was firing, we excited it this way. Uh, if we take data collected over that entire array where we've excited the target from different directions and looked at it from different directions, we can invert those data using a standard electromagnetic response model to basically determine an electromagnetic fingerprint of the target. And that fingerprint is, comprises uh, three principal axis polarizabilities which correspond to the intrinsic electromagnetic response of the target along its three principal axis directions. And that's shown here in this slide. Um, the two graphs at the bottom show uh, principal axis polarizabilities, one for a projectile and one for a horseshoe. And classification is all about telling you the difference between objects that you can't see. For the projectile, we have one polarizability here, which is a function of time, uh, which is large, and two, which are smaller and more or less equal. And those correspond to, in the first case, excitation along the long axis, and in the other cases, in perpendicular directions. For the horseshoe, we have two large responses corresponding to excitation in the plane of the horseshoe, and a smaller one for excitation perpendicular to the plane of the horseshoe. And what we do in classification is that we compare the uh, principal axis polarizabilities that we got by inverting the data with those of a library of polarizability of known targets targets of interest. And if we get a match, then we say, well, this target is likely to be a munitions item or whatever it is that you are looking for. When we go underwater, this is what we want to be able to do, the classification. But when we go underwater, there are additional electromagnetic effects um, because it's an electrically conducting medium. And they could affect classification performance. In particular, we have attenuation and distortion of the electromagnetic signals. There are new signal components from the electric field interactions with the target. This is a so-called current channeling response. There's an electromagnetic response from the seawater itself, also from bottom sediments and from a moving sea surface. There can be more corrosion of the targets, more rusting. Uh, there can be biofouling. Now, some of these effects have been observed uh, with data with collected and field tests undertaken in a sort of project uh, about 10 years ago, generally at high frequencies. They were uh, using a frequency domain sensor. The sensors that we like to use now for classification so that we can have an array of them firing in sequ sequentially um, are time domain sensors. Modeling studies, in particular one sort of project that was completed about a year or two ago, have concluded that the effects are minimal for the time domain sensors that are typically used for munitions detection and classification on land. Um, what we're up to here is to uh, basically try and provide the data to support those modeling results. And again, this is an empirical investigation of the factors that are influencing marine applications of electromagnetic induction. Ultimately, we want to validate the models for EMI performance in the marine environment and the assumptions that we use to make the calculations tractable. And then ultimately, we'll inform the models regarding parameter values that are appropriate to different sedimentary environments, uh, and also inform them about the level of complexity that has to be retained in the models to support 
reliable data inversion and target classification. What we have now are a saltwater tank. And we're doing tests there of EMI uh, and measuring targets and measuring response of the saltwater. We also have field measurements of the relevant properties uh, of the marine environments and uh, analysis and modeling support of the whole process. The saltwater tank tests uh, involve a 10-foot diameter tank uh, full of water. We fill, put it in at various stages, various amounts of salt, getting it up to uh, seawater values at 35 parts per thousand. We take those TEMTAD sensors that I described earlier uh, in waterproof cases and immerse them in the water with targets in various locations around them. Uh, and the cartoon on the right kind of shows you the schematic. The, uh, what I'm going to do now is go through some of the results, some of the things that we've measured. Uh, first is just the response from the saltwater itself. In this case, we had uh, 35 parts per thousand salinity water. Uh, the graph on the right, the blue line, shows you the response that's coming just from the water. We did that by putting the sensors up in the air and then down in the water and differencing. The dashed line shows the expected response, um, t to the minus 5 halves. And what we find is that uh, the level of the response is about 25 per 20% of what we would expect if we had a, a, an infinite tank. Uh, and the reason why we get a smaller response is that it's a finite tank. We get boundary effects. We have losses from reflections on the boundaries. And there's also, we can't really get this thing high enough above the, above the surface to completely remove all of the response. However, uh, we, we are seeing the response. And Significantly, the response that we're getting from the water itself is weak compared to signals from a 40 millimeter projectile shown by the black curves on that plot um, at a 45 centimeter range. The two curves there are for when the, the, the 45 mil, 40 millimeter projectile is suspended above the coils. Uh, the upper curve shows when it is aligned with its long axis in the direction of the coils and the uh, lower curve for the transverse excitation. The noise levels that we see with the sensors uh, are similar in the tank to what we see in air. The plot on the right shows uh, measurements of, of noise in air. For That's the red ones. Uh, the light blue. It, or the, excuse me, the green is uh, when the salinity is 8 parts per thousand, dark blue 20 parts per thousand. I it was light blue for 8, dark blue 20, and green for 35 parts per thousand. Uh, basically, they're all pretty much the same. What we're seeing, the, the variations that we're seeing, a factor of 2 or 3, uh, are more related to what's going on in the, the, envir in the surrounding environment. Where, where we are, are people, our radars being used? Uh, uh, a lot of the noise that we see comes from ele uh, electromagnetic effects in the surrounding environment. Uh, if all of these measurements had been taken in air, we would have seen the same sort of level of variability. We don't see any systematic variation with uh, salinity. And in this particular plot, I've included traces for all of the different uh, ac receiver axis orientations, and um, they're all comparable. This next plot shows uh, target signals that were measured in water. And in this case, on the lower left, we have a 40 millimeter projectile, which is set off to the side of the coils. Uh, again, about 45 centimeters from the center of the coils. And uh, this is excited with the single transmitter. And then we look at three axes of receivers. And in each case, we, we've got these things labeled x, y, and z. 
And in each case, there's a pair of curves. Um, they're difficult to distinguish between them, but uh, that's the whole point. We're essentially seeing the same response in water and in air. The differences that we can see there, the curves are essentially overlying each other. Uh, on the right, we have a aluminum ball. And again, uh, we have no difference between the two in air versus in water signals uh, for the strong response, which is in the Z direction direction is being excited. We see, see some minor differences here for transverse direction, but that's because we're down very close to the noise, and what we're seeing are, is essentially a difference in the noise levels. Uh, now I'm going to move on a little bit to some of the field data that were collected. Uh, the reason for this is that we do get a response from bottom sediments in particular, and we want to be able to incorporate that in the modeling and in our interpretation of any data that we'll collect. The data that we'll be talking about were collected in the York River estuary by folks from the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. Um, they've been working up and down the York River for years and years, and it's very well characterized. Salinity ranges from zero, near zero, up where the rivers are emptying into it, down to near 25 parts per thousand at the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, what we'll show you are data that were collected recently on uh, conductivity and temperature over the length of the estuary, and also electromagnetic properties of the sediments. Water profile shown here. Uh, we have a sets of conductivity, which are down uh, the um, the lower plot. We have uh, near the mouth of the estuary, the Chesapeake Bay. The conductivity is around 2.7 siemens per meter. Up near the headwaters, uh, we're down around one one and a half siemens per meter. Sediment electromagnetic properties. Um, we're showing here data from sediment cores taken at several locations, uh, ranging from about 10 meters, 10 kilometers up from the bay to 70 kilometers up again by the rivers. And what we see are uh, what we the plots here uh, show. In this case, it's the um, magnetic susceptibility. And down here are at various depths within the sediment core, down to uh, from 0 to 12 centimeters. And this is in the uh, water above the core. Similarly here, we have the 0 level, and then uh, electrical conductivity values in the water above and in the sediment below the surface. And the particular quantity there that we are interested in is the uh, conductivity contrast between the water and the sediments. And here we're talking about contrasts that are running 25 to 35 percent. If we plug all those numbers into uh, the models for the electromagnetic response, uh, what we find is this plot on the right. And what we show, what I show here is the seawater response that you would expect for uh, 2.5 semen per meter if we had a very, very deep ocean. Then plugging in the values for the bottom sediments, we have a set of curves for what uh, perturbation of that seawater response we would expect at 50 centimeters above the bottom, 1 meter above the bottom, and 2 meters above the bottom. And again, this is a perturbation. And red, the red curves here are for uh, negative. That means that the seawater response would be reduced 
And in fact, it's reduced by about 20% um, for the conductivity contrast and the magnetic susceptibility that we measured. Now, I did mention very briefly that you know we, we have a problem. We could potentially have a problem with target corrosion or biofouling. Um, however, that we believe that's probably more of a problem for the acoustic sensors. Um, if we had magnetite or maghemite corrosion products uh, that were fairly thick, have to be several millimeters, then that could influence the uh, electromagnetic response of the target. Biofouling is not likely to influence it because there's no magnetic contrast involved. Um, now, there are studies that are ongoing now in, co in collaboration with another sort of project, and we'll be measuring some of these targets that have been biofouled. And this um, this picture shows some of the stuff that they uh, have taken out of their fouling tank, and uh, these will be sent up and measured in due course. Uh, in the future. We're going to continue the tank testing work, uh, do target measurements at greater range, uh, by static response measurements, you know, where we transmit from one place, look at it, receive it from another, measure it from another. Uh, if we had the sensors in cases before, now we're going to put them in new pressure housing. And there will be additional field tests in the York River estuary, now taking these sensors and uh, Measuring, you know, doing profiles of the electromagnetic response as we go from the surface down to the bottom, supported by measurements of the currents, uh, suspended sediments, conductivity as a function of depth, and again, sediment and mechanical and electromagnetic properties. Uh, ultimately, you know, as we finish up this project, we would like to be able to take these sensors out and put them into uh, something that would be a little bit more operationally useful. The idea, if we do go on to an ESCCP project, would be to uh, refit a marine towed array. That was what I mentioned before that had been used for some of the magnetic measurements. Put in a large transmit loop with a bunch of received cubes, and it can be towed around you know, that meter and a half above the bottom. We believe that this ought to work. Uh, the plot down here on the bottom uh, shows calculations of the electromagnetic response from targets that were measured with the magnetometer array. And we can get an idea of the size of the target so we can calculate how big of an electromagnetic response it should be. And what we find is that at, if, at the toe depth that we would expect and the depths of the targets that were observed, that most of the signal should be well above the noise level for these sensors uh, and should be readily detectable. In summary, um, the underwater munition sites that we were able to obtain data on are very similar to on land. Uh, most targets are buried in the sediment, so they will be challenging for some of the acoustic systems. Uh, we do believe. Uh, that the ZMI systems are reliable in detecting and, and classifying munitions and clutter items on land. And again, uh, we've got this webinar coming up in November talking about that in detail and how that part of the project is closing out. The underwater munitions detection and characterization may be possible in water. Uh, we don't see uh, any showstoppers in the seawater effects on the EMI signals. And we also believe on the basis of the calculations that you can make a transmitter large enough and put together a system that can effect effectively measure these things on the bottom and in the sediment. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to Rula. Great. Thank you so much, Tom, for an informative uh, presentation. We have a lot of questions for you. Uh, what tools did the diver use to reacquire points analyzed by the MTA? 
mostly that was done visually. They went down. They they were given um, locations uh, and went down and, and basically just moved the dirt around, moved the muck around, trying to locate these things visually. In many cases, they weren't able to find the target. Uh, and uh, you know, a nice little magnetometer array, probably you know, with a nice display, probably would have been very helpful. Great, thank you. Is miniaturization of EMI instrumentation similar to advances in MFAM? Is it possible or under development right now? Uh, it's not under development to the best of my knowledge. Um, Certainly, the, the and the receivers could be modified. The part of the problem with the uh, with the miniaturization, though, is that you do need a big coil to generate a big electric electromagnetic field to excite things. Um, you might be able to make some progress on the receiver end, but I don't know how much progress one could make on the transmitter end. But I'm not. Uh, really, uh, an expert on the technology itself. Um, so you, you would probably have to talk to some other people uh, to get ideas on that. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us if uh, any investigations have been conducted related to the intensity of the active electric field and the susceptibility to electrically fired ordnance, such as modern 20 millimeter rounds? Yes, there has been. Uh, I don't have that information on in my fingertips, but um, there have been studies of these things. People have been concerned about it for some time uh, because these electromagnetic sensors have been used in munitions response work for decades. Um, and uh, I think that information is available. I would suggest that, that you know, contacting the CERTIPER ESTCP office would be a, a best way of trying to uh, track down what studies have been actually conducted and where to get hold of them. Thank you, Tom. Uh, when do we expect that current channeling effects can be significant? Does it matter for underwater UXO survey range? Well, they they generally occur, well they will occur when the target is off to the side rather than directly underneath. But they're also significantly affected by the surface condition of the target. For example, if the target is tainted or if it has uh, an, an insulating layer of it, uh, electrically insulating layer of anything on it, then the current channeling effect basically gets um, eliminated. So people have found, have been able to measure the effect generally in the frequency domain with very, at relatively high frequencies and generally only with targets that have been, uh, had the surface cleaned. Great. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit how the mechanical properties of the sediments can be measured? The mechanical properties, they um, well, there's two typical measurements that are done. One is a grain size distribution, and uh, that's important to feed into the models for erosion and movement of munitions. Basically, there's very one big part of the sort of BSTCP program in this area is has to do with the mobility of underwater munitions. Do they stay where they fell. Um, the other measurement that people do, and our colleagues at VIMS have been doing, is um, basically you put the sediment in a tank and spin the water on top of it, creating a stress on the surface, and look to see at what point uh, we start to see sediment being lifted off of the surface and uh, measure then how much sediment gets uh, pulled up into the, suspended into the water above the surface as a function of the stresses that are applied. 
And those are sort of the, the mechanical properties that people care about in this problem. Thank you. Uh, can you explain a little bit about magnetic sensitivity and electrical conductivity tests, uh, especially how they're conducted, and tell us whether these are standard tests for all laboratories? I, I, I wasn't quite sh sure I understand that question, the first part of it. Uh, can you explain how magnetic sensitivity and electrical conductivity tests. Oh, you mean conducted? magnetic susceptibility? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the magnetic susceptibility and the electrical conductivity. The, um, the susceptibility measurements are. These are all generally done on on sediment cores. You know, where they stick something down into the sediment and pull out a, a tube of it. The um, susceptibility measurements are done with a core logger, which is a is you put the sediment core, this tube of sediment, uh, in a holder and run up and down along it an instrument. And this is actually the ones that the people at VIMS have been using. It's um, manufactured by a company called Bartington. And it's a core logger. And that will output uh, low frequency susceptibility as a function of distance along the core. The conductivity measurements are made with a four probe, uh, a four electrode winner probe, uh, which is pushed down into the sediment. That works by applying a voltage to the outer two probes, which sends a current through the sediment, and then you measure the potential drop across the inner two probes, and uh, that gives you a, a measurement that's proportional to the resistivity or inversely proportional to the conductivity of the sediment. And you calibrate it using standard, um, standard materials. So that's, and that's done either uh, on the boat or dockside or in the laboratory. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, Land systems were originally used in detection and acute mode. Is something similar envisioned underwater for EMI systems? Uh, there is an ESTCP project which is actually looking at that right now to put together a system that could be lowered onto a target that had been previously identified. Um, the logistical challenges are, are significant, uh, but certainly um, Aside from the logistics and the degree of difficulty of maneuvering things around underwater, that could be done. Thank you. Uh, can you drag an EMI sensor along the bottom of the ocean floor? Yes, you can. Um, and there are people who are looking at uh, dragging them along behind bottom crawlers. There have been people who have measured um, sediment properties, uh, basically sediment conductivity and uh, susceptibility by dragging t uh, frequency domain sensors along the bottom in relatively deep water. Uh, again, the, you know, the issues are, you know, have to do with if, if you're dragging something along the bottom, making sure that you know, you've got Release connectors and things like that, so that if you run into something, you can uh, you can recover your sensor. All right, and one last question for you before we pull Mark back in: uh, Were surveys done after diver investigation to see if anything was missed in the reacquisition step? No. No. Okay. Great. Uh, Mark, we're going to uh, go back to you with, uh, with one question specific to your presentation. Uh, do you envision your sensor uh, to be used with ROB platform? Absolutely. All, all kinds of, of uh, small platforms we would love to use our devices on. And we're working also in solving and addressing some of the compensation issues which have to do with removing the signals that you get from the platform you're on. And we've actually developed the sensor with very high bandwidth 
uh, to make that process easier, in fact. So we look forward to, to further work uh, to adapt these, uh, to utilize these sensors on all kinds of platforms such as that. Uh, wonderful. And then another question uh, for you, Tom. Uh, is the saltwater tank available for sensor testing by other projects? The yes, one it is. Yes. yes, it is. Uh, and in fact, uh, there is another project that will be coming down to um, put some things in there for a first test uh, probably in a few weeks. Great. And then some questions that we'd like both of you to answer, starting with Mark. Um, do you think the success in improving remediation productivity that has been demonstrated on land can be duplicated in marine environments? Yes, yes, I do. Um, uh, not necessarily for a, for a specific technical reason, but the approach that CERTIP and ESTCP have brought to bear in solving the problem on land I think will be equally successful in the water. I, I, I'm a big fan of the management of the of the CERTIP and ESTCP programs, um, the way they select and and guide the research uh, and demonstration projects, uh, building upon previous generation work and improving upon it, bringing in new ideas as well. I think is extremely effective, and and I think that's in large part why uh, so much so many gains were made on the land side. And I think with, with the same set of people addressing the marine problem, that it's equally solvable. Thank you. And Tom, what is your opinion on this? Uh, much the same as Mark's, uh, with the one caveat that, that the marine environment is more challenging in that uh, you can't just walk around on it like we do on land. Uh, so that's really where, um, where the challenges are going to arise. It's you know, the whole question of deployment of the systems, not so much the, you know, the fundamental physics or um, process, signal processing that goes along with it. Um, whether or not those deployment challenges can be dealt with properly, you know, that remains to be seen. Um, but it could end up proving to be difficult and expensive. Thank you both. Another question for both of you, starting with you, Mark. Uh, how do you think electromagnetic sensors compare with acoustic sensors for underwater munitions response work? They're certainly quite different. Uh, acoustic sensors using using sound propagation, uh, use wavelengths much, much smaller than, than the electromagnetic sensors. And so they're useful uh, to focus beams of energy, use, a, use them in imaging modes, uh, use them from large standoffs, uh, all of which you can't do with a magnetometer or an EMI system. You've got to put those sensors down close to the object. But the difference, well, I'll let, I'll let Tom continue on with that. I'm sure he can, he can <laughs> further answer. Hey, Tom? Yeah, uh, what Mark says is exactly correct. Uh, you know, I like to think of the acoustic things as, you know, they, they've come along so far that they're almost like seeing things. You know, they give you a picture of what's on the sea floor. Uh, over a fairly wide range, fairly large distances. Um, there is work going on, on on getting them to see a little bit into the bottom. Uh, and uh, you know, that's been the subject of some of the other webinars. The, but the problem is in many respects similar to what we have on land. Uh, you can walk along over a munitions response site and pick up the things that are on the surface. Uh, but you know, it's hard to get the ones underneath. And that's where uh, certainly the magnetometers could find the things underneath, but it took the electromagnetic sensors, sensor arrays that CERTIP and ESTCP put together to be, able to, to be able to tell what it was that's under the surface. Uh, 
and you know, is it something that could possibly be safely left in the ground, or is it likely to be something that could be dangerous? And I think that that whole view applies equally underwater. Um, that, you know, as I mentioned, from the what we saw from the magnetometer surveys, a lot of the stuff is is in the sediment, and uh, may not be accessible even to the low frequency acoustic systems. And perhaps the only way of getting any really useful information as to what the object is will be electromagnetic. Great. Thank you both for um, a wonderful um, Q&A session and for very informative presentations. Um, for our audience on the phone, uh, you can download a copy of the slides um, using um, the sort of an ESSB web page. And in about a couple of weeks, there will be a copy of the, record, um, of the recording uh, for this webinar. Um, our next webinar is on Thursday, October 1st, and will focus on hexavalent chrome elimination from hard chrome surface finishing. This webinar will feature three speakers, Dr. Jonathan McCree from Integrant Technologies, as well as Mr. Jack Benfer and Mr. Robin Prado from the Naval Air Systems Command. Um, before we conclude, I would like to remind you uh, again that um, this information can be downloaded, and it will be um, quite useful if you um, want to uh, get additional information on the projects you've heard us um, describe today. Uh, we would appreciate it if you can please take a moment uh, from your busy day to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at this time. And with that, this concludes today's webcast. Thank you for joining us. Operator?